Zappa. Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and I am delighted to tell you that we have won the victory. If you know about the publishing business, you know that there are battles that take place, and the copyright has been returned to me, and we have now republished the CODIST, the mystery behind Aaron's robe, and the secret weapon of Satan weaponizing DNA to try to take out the Jewish people. It's an amazing story, depth of truth, research in Israel, research in Washington with the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, with Mossad, with great scientists who have supported the concept, the theory, and yet it is a biblical thriller that you cannot put down. I'm also excited to share with you the release of The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life, where I take you on a journey through seven parts of a tree, beginning with the dirt, and it is the tree of life. And God has seven wonderful lessons. He teaches us through the natural, uh, of supernatural truth, 49 truths involved in a parable that God gave me. As a matter of fact, if you go to our Facebook page, Igniting a Nation, you can click on a special, and if you will share uh, the picture of these two books and write on your page, shared, then you'll enter a contest, and on February 20th, we'll send the winner of that contest a copy of each of these books. We're very excited to join uh, this morning with Mike Berry, who is the author of a new book, Confessions of an Adoptive Parent, Hope and Help from the Trenches of Foster Care and Adoption. He's the author of three books, a public speaker, blogger, father of eight children, and husband to Kristen. He is the co-creator of the award-winning blog, Confessions of an Adoptive Parent.com, as well as the support and resource site, Oasis Community. It lives outside of Indianapolis, Indiana, with his family. Mike Berry, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you for having me on. Well, it is a pleasure. You know that uh, you and I had the opportunity to share yesterday offline. Uh, your original interview was scheduled for yesterday, so there was a lot of people that said, hey, when, when, what happened to Mike Berry? Say, hey, he's so good, we're having him on two days in a <laughs> row. Uh, but I'm an adoptive dad, and uh, my 28-year-old daughter, Amanda, was handed to me outside the delivery room. Uh, I was the first other than the nurse, to hold her and to make that eye contact for the first time uh, with this child was a life-changing experience for me. And going through the adoption process was uh, probably comparable to what the mother feels when she's giving birth naturally, uh, the squeezing through the birth canal, because I was put under so much scrutiny and so much examination by the FBI, by local sheriff's authorities, by adoption agency, uh, by regula regulations and red tape and social workers and classes and certifications that I had to go through in order to bring this child home, that it occurred to me that we have millions of children being born naturally and nobody even asked them a single question. Mm -hmm. And yet you and I have had to go through a process of scrutiny and expense that can range from 30 to even a hundred thousand uh, dollars because we are so intent on becoming a parent. Yep. Where did your journey begin in this concept of, of uh, you and your wife making a decision that uh, you were going to go through the process of foster yep parenting and adoption? Yeah, well, uh, that's the, that's one of the biggest questions we receive. Um, and I always catch people off guard by taking them all the way back in time to the late 90s when we were just, just before we were, we were about to get married. Uh, we were sitting on our college campus one uh, really cold winter night and Kristen looked at me and said, I think we should adopt all of our kids. And I immediately resisted that idea which always catches people off guard because I'm, I, I'm, I've co-founded a, a global platform that advocates for foster care and adoption. Right. So that always catches people off guard. But th going all the way back then when she said that, 
um, even though I resisted, um, that was where that was kind of the beginning of, of God beginning to work on my heart in ways that I didn't even know and shape me and mold me. And the, the very, the fairly long story short there is that my heart did change. And, um, in April, 2002, we welcomed our first daughter, firstborn daughter through private adoption here in Indianapolis, Indiana, where we're from. And two years after that, we began the foster care journey. And I, I can, I can identify with you the, the, how excruciating it was. Mine was a little different because I didn't grow up in a, in a family that, that, had anything to do with adoption. All everybody in the Barry family came in to the world the old-fashioned way, um, biological. Kristen, on the other hand, grew up with adoption and foster care as the story in the background of their lives. Her her grandfather aged, grew up in the foster care system and actually aged out. And then her youngest brother was adopted from Bulgaria in the early '90s. So she, this was already a storyline. In her life, but it wasn't for me, and um, that's you know. So I often tell people I didn't resist because I didn't like adoption. I just didn't understand it. I didn't understand like most of the world didn't understand, you know, what it was all about. And and really, I would say now how beautiful uh, adoption is. So we began our our <laughs> began our adoption story at odds, which. Thankfully, I, I, I would say this, that I was led through my, out of my selfishness, because it really was selfishness on my part. You know, I just didn't, I didn't think about anybody outside of me. Um, and we began that journey in 2002, and we've never looked back. And today, I, I stand on the other, uh, many years, almost 16 years later, grateful, deeply grateful. So here you are with a, a, a ministry and a vision that's birthed out of, Violent agreement. Mm-hmm. Really good way to put it. I like that. <laughs> Maybe the spiritual violence, not not physical right, right, violence, not physical but, violence, but spiritual spiritual, spiritual. Vi- violent agreement. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, we we ultimately got there, but uh, here here's uh, Mike kicking and screaming all the way through his agreement. Very uh, true. You know, your story is interesting because. <clears throat> You also adopted, uh, in uh, a twenty. She was twenty-four when you. Uh huh. Yeah. When oh, you, our oldest daughter was twenty-four. Twenty-four years old, and mm-hmm. I want you to share the story about why. Why would you adopt a twenty-four-year-old child? They, they weren't without a home. They weren't without a life. They had a life. They yeah. and they had a name. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, we that's another question we get a lot, a, a lot. Uh, and you know, it with with our oldest daughter, um, the really bold uh, part of me would would answer somebody who who would ask me why, I would answer them with a why not, you know, what's what what's the reason? And that usually prompts a conversation of uh, that that leads into a lot of myths around older adoptions. Mm-hmm. And when I say older adoptions, I mean like teenagers into young adults. You know, there's a lot of myth around that, which we could, we could do in a, a whole separate segment on the myths surrounding adoption. But with our oldest daughter, um, that she was 24 years old, but we had known her since she was 15. Um, when we first moved to Indiana, we came here, uh, as youth pastors in a, in a small church, uh, in a suburban area. And we, uh, we we always had this draw to uh, uh, to kids who I would say were on the fringe. Um, Kristen and I, my wife Kristen and I, were both fringe kids. We never we were never the popular ones. We were never the you know the the, the sought out ones. We weren't the star athletes or the the scholars that won full ride scholarships. It just wasn't us. We we were always kind of in the background. When we met our oldest daughter Rachel. That's that's who she was. She was she was the proverbial wallflower in this suburban church where kids came from a lot of affluency. Um, she she just that just wasn't her, and so we instantly had this connection with her, and um, she instantly connected to us. And really, what we like to say is she adopted us before we adopted her. 
um, because she kind of chose us as her family and really just latched onto my wife in particular, who became her mentor, small group leader. And then when her when her biological mother passed away one week after uh, high school grad her high school graduation, she moved in with us for the summer, mm-hmm. and um, then and we saw her. Uh, we moved her into college. We 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 were her home when she came home on breaks. Uh, our ki- our kids at that point at that point we had already we now had uh, three young children because um, we had become foster parents at that point. And plus, beyond that, we were also taking in foster placements. Um, so so she really adopted us before we adopted her. But then on her twenty when she was twenty four years old, it was a July afternoon. She came into our house. She was having lunch with us. Then she, when we were sitting in our living room and she looked at us and she said, Hey, by the way, I know what I want for Christmas, which was like, really? It's July, but we can talk about Christmas. We love Christmas. Right. And she said, I want to be adopted. And we looked at her and we were like, really? And we said, you know, this has always been your family and it always will be. Nothing will change that. But if a piece of paper from the state of Indiana right, right. and a birth certificate with our last name on it would, would seal the deal for you. Absolutely. And you know, I, I, that's the reason why I answer the question of why with the question, why not? Because I think that we look at that, like we, we often look at older children and we think that I, I don't want, I don't think we verbalize that they're hopeless or we think that they're hopeless cases, but I think we have this idea that that two things that they may be a troubled kid, but then second of all, that we may not have anything to offer. And I just don't think that's the case. I don't. I don't think that that's the case. I don't think that um, that we don't have something to offer. I think we have very much do. And and in the years since, that's been seven years ago. Yeah, it was 2011, 2010. Rachel is is as much our, a part of our family as any of our other children, um, and she's as much our daughter as if we would have given birth to her, you know, and and she would be biologically ours. So there's just there's there's a lot of beauty when you choose to look past your our own hangups and and <laughs> and ideals, and we didn't have to look hard for beauty. You know, Mike, Mike, I'm not sure that people really understand. Uh, first of all, the Bible talks about widows and orphans. Yeah. So there's an orphan population worldwide. Uh, we actually support uh, Leanna Sincronata with the 34 million orphan children up on the Ganges River. I mean, imagine yep. 34 million orphaned children. It's it's, yeah, mi- it's mind-boggling, uh, but the numbers around the world are also staggering. The numbers in America are staggering of how many children are in the quote-unquote system. Yeah. Uh, now, s- uh, approximately 75% stati- statistically of uh, of young pe- teenagers and under who are in the system have uh they're in the system because of uh parents drug problems parents alcohol problems and they bring in their own issues sometimes Mm -hmm. oftentimes about 75 percent on a literary literacy scale are sometimes slower or or lower on the literacy literacy scale because they don't have the home parent to get them through that process yeah Uh, you know, there's there's so many understandings, misunderstandings. The news is filled with the horror stories of the foster parents who have taken advantage of the system and are bilking the system and taking money and not even and, and the kids don't even live with them or there is no such kid. And you hear about these kind of things. Unfortunately, we don't hear the great stories we're not hearing no, no, we don't. Uh, uh, of of uh, a, a system and, and we have a system that's unfortunately that's broken it's antiquated it's mm-hmm. based on uh 1940s and 50s model 
that has not been updated. Uh, social services uh, uh, are overworked. Uh, and there is the advent of this new thing where children are calling the Department of Family and Children's Services and and, oh, yeah. and, and, and turning their parents in or saying they want out. I grew up in 1950. I was born in 52. Inconceivable, you know. You know, if if, I, if you got out of line, the local beat cop would grab you by the ear and, and drag you and, home. And drag you home. Uh, yeah. And you knew him by name. He was Max, the cop, and Mr. And Mrs. Walker. Eric's had it again, and the, you know, and and literally take you by the ear throw you through the door and go back on his beat. I mean, yeah. we, we didn't have those problems that we were aware of, but we did. We, we, we knew that there were orphanages. We just didn't know anything about right, right. the kids who were in the orphanage. They, there was just an orphanage down the road. Okay. Help, help, us, help me understand, our audience understand, the system, and you are both a foster and an adoptive parent, and they are not the same. One is, a temp no. one is a temporary uh, that can become permanent. One is a temporary that is purposely temporary. And one is permanent for the purpose of permanency. Sure. So help navigate us, if you would, through the whole process or the, or the, or the systems. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think you're exactly right. You know, in, in the, and I can, I can just be, uh, I, I'm a transparent person. Obviously, uh, my, my, business, my business has the word confessions in it. Um, you know, my son, uh, my oldest son is in a residential treatment program now for extreme behavior. He suffers from fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, uh, which is a common disorder um, that children through the foster care system and who have, ad who have been adopted from traumatic places deal with. He's at a place um, that's we're still referred to as the state hospital. But 50 years ago, that was considered a... Uh, psych, a, a mental hospital, right. a mental institute, right? And we, and back in those days, it would kind of be like we threw the kids away and forgot about them. They're locked up. They're no longer our problem. Now that's advanced, but it's kind of taken on a whole, it, it's, it, there was a stigma back then, but there's still a stigma today. Mm -hmm. And even, even with, you know, you talk about the foster care system, we will turn on our television sets and we'll see a law and order special victims unit episode or a, you know, criminal minds or whatever. And they use foster care and adoption as a headline. And it's even a punchline. You know, one of my favorite movies is the, the first Avengers film back in 2012. But even then there was a punchline where, you know, um, where Samuel L. Jackson's character is talking to Thor and says, well, he's your brother. And Thor responds, well, he's adopted, you know, and it's like, ha ha ha, we laugh, but that punchline sticks. So adoption and foster care have been this punchline and it goes back to that misunderstanding. There's a misunderstanding and there's also w only what people see in Hollywood and what they see through headlines. Um, so you do have, so you have to look beyond that. You have to hear, you have to listen, press into the stories that people like me are telling Right. That right. listen, this is hard. This is difficult because children who come from trauma, you know, they're they it manifests itself in difficult ways. But there's so much beauty. You know, I look at my children and our journey is messy and imperfect. But I'm like, isn't that what life's all about? It's finding beauty. I mean, that's our that's that's humanity. Finding life, finding hope in the middle of the difficulties, the the diamond in the rough, the the beauty from ashes. Right? Is what that's what the Bible talks about. And that describes the foster adoptive journey. The difference in terms of the, the, you're talking about like the technical differences. You know, we are former foster parents. Actually, we're no longer licensed foster parents. We ended our license a couple of years ago. But, you know, we, I think that fo the difference obviously is, is when you're talking about adoption, you're talking about what you said a minute ago, permanency. I mean, this is, this is the legally, permanently, they become a part of your family. Foster care is temporary. You, you, in fact, we even tell people if you go into this with a permanency mindset, you're going to be disappointed because that's not the point of foster care. Although it can turn into that, and right. certainly six out of our eight adoptions did, even though that's not. We only entered one case or two cases 
that it was foster to adopt. The rest were not. Um, but the mentality there is that you are a temporary home for a child who is eventually the plan to reunify or move back home. Not always the case. Um, you know, but I think the difference is we did both, but we didn't plan on doing both. Um, we, we, we had adopted our firstborn daughter, Jayla, and then we were asked by a, fr- a friend of a friend in our church, hey, listen, could you guys r- rush and get your foster care license because this person is losing, is going to have their children removed into the, into the system. So we rushed and got it done, and like we, we crammed a 13-week process into like a three-week process. Um, but you know, then again, I, back and something you said a, mo- a little bit ago, talked about the brokenness of the system and, and the, the, just the inefficiency of the system. That's, that's true. I haven't been to a state in this nation that hasn't dealt with the same issues, turnover in caseworkers, lack of funding. Um, sometimes the funding's not spent in the right way. Um, children who were supposed to be either reunified or moved into adoption after six to eight months, it's been four years. Um, and that, I think that happens because again, we have this stigma that, well, this is a, this is a, uh, this is somebody else's problem and let's move it on to some, to somebody else and let's forget about it. And we as a country kind of forget about those kind of things, you know, when it doesn't appeal to, you know, what we want, the good old American dream, it doesn't make it into our wheelhouse of thought, you know, and again, that I could go on and on about that and my, my personal beliefs about that. But I will say this: I think the the conversation has been changing, slowly but surely. It is. You know, there's a couple of realities to adoption that I, that I want to discuss with you. First of all, is there is real there is a real, true bona fide adoption adoptive child syndrome, if you will, of searching for an identity because of. Uh, abandonment issues, uh, if you're in an open adoption scenario and you believe, as I believe, that I would never lie to my daughter from the earliest time of understanding she knew that she was adopted but that I was her, I was her daddy, that, mm-hmm. that, 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 there was, that she couldn't be taken away, that, and, then, and then when it came time for her to have the opportunity to meet her birth mother, uh, she said, I don't really have any kind of need for that. It wasn't mm-hmm. until she began to make plans for marriage that she decided that she actually wanted to have uh, a face-to-face meeting with her birth mother. And it was very anticlimactic. It was very 10 minutes and it's like, okay, you know, I got the check in the box, I met you. I, I have a family. I have a mom. I have a yeah, dad. Yeah. Um, they gave me a life, and all I want to do is thank you. Thank you because yeah. now that I know you, I know you couldn't have given me anything that they gave me. Yeah. You, you couldn't have been anything that they were to me. So I believe that God ordained this. But there are still uh, times of identity. St- yeah. She's 28. All right, and she yep. was adopted at birth. There are still times when I recognize that these are identity uh, uh, discomforts, if you will, or identity uh, insecurities. Uh, mm-hmm. Because you go to the doctor and they ask you for your medical history of your parents and you can't give one. And, right. you're, and you're put on the spot and say, I don't have one, I'm adopted. So then you wonder, well, I don't know genetically if I have a genetic disposition to this or to that, and everything is a blank sheet of paper. Well, you don't think about that when there are a tiny little baby you're holding in the hands, right? Right. But she's 28 now, and she's going out, and she's filling out insurance and doing things and going to a doctor, and I don't have a medical history. I can't tell you. But I can't even tell you if my birth mother's living. What age did my birth no. father die at? Or what was the cause? Or did they have... I can't answer any of that. And that's, yeah. uh, that's going to be a lifetime. She'll spend the rest of her life having to answer those questions. I don't know. 
right? Yeah. And we have to be aware of that. Uh, first of all, for you out there that are biological parents and have not had to go through this process, uh, each one of us have our own unique stories. My, my story is incredibly unique. Mike's story is incredibly unique. Every story is unique in how this child, uh, but yet um, I look at the pictures of your children and uh, there are physical resemblances. God does, he does both the complement and the opposite uh, because yeah. you have a child of color. Mm -hmm. right? uh, but in adoption, you know, if, if you want to be the adoptive parent that checks off and says that I want a white uh, American, you're, 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 going to be yeah. wait, you're going to be waiting a very, 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 very long time. Yeah, uh, yeah, and people do that. They certainly do that. They do. I mean, we, we, we've heard lots of tragic stories where people do that. You know, I think um, I, I love the topic of identity because we've had a lot of conversations about that. Um, my, my firstborn daughter, um, about a year, year and a couple of months ago, back in 2016, um, we, she, she, when she was, she was our firstborn daughter, private adoption, um, and we did not have an open adoption. Uh, her birth mom did not want that at the time back in, in 2002, but then we finally made contact with her. Now we're in the age of social media, um, where anybody can find anybody realistically. Right. Um, and, and we set up a meeting, um, with her birth mom, with her and us and her birth mom. And that was very healing for our daughter. In fact, she became a whole new kid after that. Um, and I think it was a, it was a point of closure for her. And this is, I'm not saying, I don't think this is every situation, every case, you know, it was kind of like what you were saying with your daughter, 10 minutes. And it was like an, 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 an eternal bucket was filled up. Right. Well, that's the way it was with, with my kid. And, you know, I, one of the things we, when we first went, we first started on this journey, we, we were kind of, nobody actually said this outwardly, but you kind of had this idea like, okay, well, we're now the parents. And so now we have to, you know, I mean, that's the birth parent over there and we're the parents over here and we have to keep this, this distance, you know, that again, not communicated verbally, but it was this idea that you thought, okay, well that, I guess that's the right thing to do. Right. But then you realize, wait, my kid, this person created my child, you know, and whatever happened to cause this to happen, you know, where she's now he or she is now my child. We celebrate, we celebrate the fact that we have that child, but whatever happened, we put that aside and we celebrate the fact that that, that if, if it weren't for this person and their, their choice, you know, to place their baby for adoption, I would never know my child. So we celebrate that reality and that truth. And we also, I think we need to, we need to put aside these fears that meeting a birth parent or, learning about heritage we need to put that that fear aside and and embrace that you know we i, I had a conversation with somebody a co about a year ago who said well i don't see my my child's color i just look at my kids and i see i see my kids i don't see their color and i said i do i i my my children who are black i see their color and i'm not saying that in any kind of negative way i'm saying that in a in a celebratory way like I'm celebrating who they are. So I see all my kids' uniqueness and I see their beauty and we celebrate that beauty. You know, we 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 have intentionally done things with our 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 two daughters, our two younger daughters who are both African American. We've intentionally done things or allowed them to experience things that celebrate their heritage and their culture. Um you know, my daughter goes to a school down in inner city Indianapolis that is is very it celebrates the arts, it celebrates it's very diverse, and it's been a, an amazing experience. You know, um, and we let her do that by choice. She could we let her hey wherever you want to go to school, and she chose that that school, and it's been very very good. So, going back to this identity conversation, we've been having a lot of these conversations lately with transracial adoptees in particular, and and what we hear from each one of the adoptees is 
celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. Our right. good friend Angela out on the West Coast is African American. She's an adoptee and she has a huge platform reaching adoptees. And when we asked her that very question, like, how do we help our kids celebrate, or learn their, find their identity? She's like, celebrate who they are, celebrate where they've come from, you know, in terms of heritage, not all of them have come from good places. You know, some of them, it's, it's, it was a traumatic past. So you have to be cautious there. But I think that, you know, as much as we can celebrating where our kids have come from and who they are and not being afraid to connect with a birth parent or, you know, or a, a birth family, if it's safe and if it's healthy, you know, like ima imagine that every adopted child, whether it verbalized or not, wants to know why did my mother and father not want me? Mm -hmm. I, I don't care who you are and how you say, no, my child's so completely secure. They're so settled in. Everything's so wonderful and so perfect. That child has entertained the thought that the reason why you're their parents is because somebody didn't want to be their mother or somebody didn't want to be their father. And they yep. have struggled in silence with that question. Mm -hmm. And we have a responsibility as, as adoptive parents to recognize that this was not a, a not wanting and there's nothing. and and and. It's inconceivable that a fetus could cause a, a person to not want to have the child. Right. But, but we're not talking about logic and reason. We're talking about the emotions of a child and how they process. <clears throat> and there is an inherent sense of rejection. There is an inherent sense of, of abandonment. There's an inherent tendency to go to those places because they were in quote unquote dictionary terms rejected they were in yeah. dictionary terms abandoned they were in dictionary terms given away they yeah. were in dictionary terms let go and so yeah. those are real feelings and if we as parents don't validate the reality of that and listen we do have a responsibility to know the story. I don't want to lie yeah. to my daughter and yeah. make up some fairy tale. Uh, I told her the whole story as it unfolded, and it was an interesting story because I had six weeks to become a father. I had a total of six weeks notice from the moment I was said, you, 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 you've been chosen, uh, yeah. you have six weeks. I, and I spent every day with the birth mother for six weeks speaking to my unborn child because I heard that they can hear you and they'll recognize your voice. And when they laid her in my arms and I spoke her name, her, her eyes turned to me. She yeah. recognized. She was drawn to the voice. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's a natural. So there was a bond that was formed. Yeah. Uh, not everybody gets that privilege. Not everybody gets that. But if you have that opportunity, please take that opportunity. Please yeah. know your child's story because at some point in time, you need to tell them that story. The good, the bad, the ugly, whatever the story is, it is their story. You, yeah. know, you know who your mom and dad are. Uh, you, you were entitled to know who they were. They told you who they were. You you were a natural born child. Uh, it's why in the adoption decree, and especially in my case because I'm Jewish, the California adoption decree says that this child is entitled to every God-given right as if she was a natural born child. Absolutely. That, that entitles her to citizenship in Israel because she was born with the God-given right of having a Jewish father. Yeah. See, that, that would be trite and meaningless to somebody, those words, but to a Jew who has the right of return to have dual citizenship, she is entitled to that by adoption. Mm -hmm. You, my friend, are adopted into the Commonwealth of Israel uh, as not a natural born Jewish child, but 
you are granted the same rights I have as a natural born Jewish child, as a believer in Jesus. And so yeah. adoption is exactly how every Christian came into the family of God. Oh, yeah. And, and if we don't take it and look at this as a God-given privilege and understand his story, right? yeah. and that we, we, we are the living, breathing story of adoption ourselves, and we put it in a biblical perspective, it changes the whole context of adoption and, and uh, you know, take election versus adoption. Trust me, adoption is exactly what it was all about. It was those that did not have a legal right, right to carry yeah. the name of the Lord. The Lord gave them the legal right to do so, and it was yeah. through yeah. adoption. Yeah. Uh, we uh, we uh, uh, are talking with Mike Berry, author of Confessions of an Adopted Parent, Hope and Health in the Trenches of Foster Care and Adoption. Uh, you also can uh, find him at uh, their blog, which is called ConfessionsOfAnAdoptivParent.com. Normally we would take a break, but this is much too important. Uh, uh, a, a topic is it, much, much, much too personal because yeah. I am an adoptive father and I am just so incredibly proud of my daughter and and the difficulties that adoptive kids have to overcome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And adoptive parents. There's not a single Wait. there's not a single adoptive parent that has not heard the words you're you're not my real father. You're not my real mother. Okay, uh, it, it, it tends to work its way into the vocabulary when there is a disciplinary issue, and and you have to have a response uh, uh, for this. T tell me, uh, and I, and I want to talk about the book. Um, you start out the book by saying you are not alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why the message of you're not alone? Yeah. Um, the, it, this, as, as you know, uh, when you when you have brought children into your family from traumatic places, um, particularly in our situation, um, you know, we adopted our children from foster care and some of them have gone through have come from some pretty traumatic places, um, abuse, neglect, malnourishment. Um, and then a cup, and then three of our, our children have been diagnosed with alcohol related neurodevelopmental disorder, which is under the umbrella of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Right. And those, that trauma and these disorders can bring about behaviors and, you know, seasons even where it's very difficult. Um, our, like I, I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, our oldest son, can't live at home. And that's not our choice. That was a choice that was made by the authorities, um, essentially. And the reason for that is that his behavior was dangerous. Um, it, it would be easy to look at my kid and think, well, that's just a bad kid behaving badly, but it's not. He's not. He's a kid that's speaking and behaving out of his trauma. And while some of his behavior has been choice, he's chosen to do, do, do this or that, he's also, his brain has suffered permanent damage. So because we deal with that, it, it can lead to this place of feeling very isolated because what we've dealt with with some of our children in terms of behavior and emotions and, you know, struggles, you can't just go to your next door neighbor, especially no. where I live in suburbia America. I mean, we live in poster, poster child suburbia America here in central Indiana. I can't just go next door. I mean, I'm looking out my office window right now. I can't go over to those people's house over there and say, hey, it's great to meet you. I'm Mike. And oh, by the way, my son deals with this, 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 and this, you know, or hey, could I, could I just share with you what's, what I'm going on? Because they're going to look at you with this, wait, what? This misunderstanding. And that leads to a place where, you, where of isolation where you feel like, you know what? It's, ju it's just easier if I don't have to, to be honest about what's going on. If I could just get into my garage shut the garage door, hide out in my home, hunker down and weather the storm when my kid is raging or 
you know, going through an emotional meltdown, which, which tends to happen, um, it'd just be easier if I hide away from the world. But hiding away from the world is degrading to our spirit and our souls, right? right? Um, and I firmly believe the way that the hope that I have is in Christ alone, right? But I think the way that Christ brings that hope is he brings other people in our lives, flesh and blood human beings, in this case, fellow foster adoptive parents who get where I'm at, get what I'm going, they understand what I'm going through. There's nothing that, that I could share or confess that, that would shock them. And not only that, they love my kids and they love me no matter what I'm going through. And so I, I think that some of the he- most healing moments in our lives, whether you're a foster parent, adoptive parent, or just a, a traditional parent, or just a human being in general, some of the greatest healing moments in our lives are when we have been dealing with something a struggle, an addiction, a sin, whatever you want to call it, struggling with something with our kids. And we look at another flesh and blood human being who, who says, you know what? I'm right there with you. You're not alone. I I know exactly what you're going through. It doesn't solve our problems, but it gives us hope. It lets us know, okay, you know what? I'm not, I don't have to live in isolation anymore. I don't have to hide away from the world. I can be, I can be who I am. I can celebrate who we are knowing that there are other people who celebrate who we are. And I think that's how Jesus becomes the most real. In my my life, Jesus conceptually, <laughs> the concept of Jesus has become literal because another human being has demonstrated Jesus in flesh to me when I'm going through it, you know? And that gives me hope. In your community is uh, this support group of foster parents or foster adopted parents, uh, is this a church? Uh, is it separate from the church? Do you think the church has a role in uh, providing for uh, adoptive and foster parent small groups and mm-hmm. that there should be teachings and there should be resources and pastoral care of uh, I, I, I minister in a, a women's recovery center. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are f- around 500 women and around 400 children, and all the 400 children all have fetal alcohol syndrome, all are crack babies, all are going through, all have needs, and their parents, their mothers have needs, their children have needs. Mm -hmm. and pastoral care of just helping them deal with life uh, is essential. And this was uh, the vision of um, a woman who went through it herself and wound up in an alternative sentencing program and built an entire ministry out of it, actually bought an old hospital and turned it into this recovery center because it had all the rooms it had it had everything they needed yeah. it just had grown old and they had built yeah. a new hospital yeah. and so they took over the old hospital uh, yeah, yeah. It, does the church have a role does the body of christ because mm-hmm. unless i'm mistaken i believe the word orphan uh and the word widow are used often together as yeah. being one of the highest priority communities of ministry that the body of Christ is called to serve. Yeah, I absolutely, the church has a role and a responsibility. Um, my, the support community that we ha- are a part of started in the church, started when we moved to Indiana, we started working in a small, that small church I was talking about earlier in the broadcast. And the, the, the two couples in, in particular that we spend all of our time with um, are also foster adoptive parents those relationships were born in that church. Now they grew outside of that. And eventually we all three, all three couples moved on from that church. Um, so, you know, that, that first part of your question, I think that, you know, we teach people that your support community can exist anywhere. Right. You know, it can, it can, it can grow out of anywhere. Now, when we're talking from a faith perspective, um, I absolutely 100% believe that, that the church has a responsibility to to care for widows and orphans, as James one twenty seven says, 
that's one piece of it. But I think that a big way that we care for widows and orphans, because oftentimes people think, well, I don't know the I don't know the first thing about being a foster parent, adopt parent, or they'll say, does that mean I should be that? Not necessarily. It uh, not everybody is called to be a foster or adoptive parent, but everybody's called to do something. So you may not be called to be a foster parent or adoptive parent. And trust me, I've met some people that I'm like, yeah, you shouldn't. (laughs) I love you, but you should not, you should not do this. You're not called to do this, but they could be called to, to help the families who are called to do it. And so I think that that James 127 verse has a a lot of different facets to it. Um, Hands on, but then also hands up, which I mean, hands on would be, you're doing this. You're you're a foster adoptive parents, but hands up, or I've got your back. I'm holding up your back. Right. And and I think that, I, and I, you know what? We've done a couple of posts on our blog that have been a little hard because we've had to say, church, listen, we love you, but you're kind of blowing it. You're kind of blowing it. You know? I mean, we 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 are here in Indianapolis. We have a bunch of like mega mega church. We're one of those cities in the U.S. that has like the greatest the highest population of mega churches, churches over like 1,500 or 2,000. And we have gone to a couple of these churches. I love them. I love the people that are there. But all of this money is being poured into to lighting and video and the way the auditorium looks and smells and the, the graphic designs. And that's all great. That's that's wonderful. But then I'm, then I'm thinking there's all these families that – and I'm being biased, of course, because I am a foster adoptive family. So I'm thinking of it purely from this perspective that, listen, there's all of this, these families here that are just kind of drowning and they're being forced to find their support outside of the church because they've been harshly judged in the church. Now, this is not every church, but we have we know people and us included who have gone through this. And so what I'm saying, what I often will tell church leaders is, listen, I'm not expecting you to cut a check for a million dollars to a foster adoptive support group. That would be great. But I think you can provide space and it can be intentional. And I think that you could appoint ministry leaders to be intentional and then you you can create space. Listen, the the least amount of work a church can do to support a group, to support a group like us, foster adoptive parents, is just create safe space. Space for us to come in and dump our truck of emotions and not be judged for that. Be welcomed in. That's been some of the most powerful moments that we've experienced. It's when we've had those moments where where we feel like this is safe. Listen, this is safe for us to admit that this is really hard and here's why it's really hard. You know, you, know? you, you actually set the book up this way and it was very intentional. You have... Part one and part two. Part one is, let me tell you the downside. Let me tell you the troubles. Let me tell you the difficulties. Let me tell you the hardships. Let me share with you in the muck, the mire, the details, the fight, the battle, the feelings, the emotions, the frustrations. All right. And and you're not alone. I've been there. You've been there. There's two people on this show right now talking. Both of us have been there. We've both been in the system. We've both dealt with the system. We've dealt with yep. the social workers. We've dealt with social services, Department of, of, of Health and Children Services, all, all the different agencies we have dealt with. We have taken the child to the pediatrician all right, who has bruises. Okay, Never yep. laid a hand on my child. But because they know that they're a foster or they're adoptive, they look with a jaundiced eye, and you are you're wondering, uh, or your social worker pays a home visit that day, and your child uh, the day before, one of your children smacked the other one with a wiffle ball bat, and there's a welt on their arm, and uh, you know you you don't you don't want to put long sleeves on the child because you don't want to appear like you're covering up, but you don't want to put short sleeves on because you know the social worker is going to see it and ask you the question. And normal families don't have to deal with that decision-making matrix. And it is virtually, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it, it is whitewater rafting all the time. But oh, yeah. then in part two, the finding hope. And so you lay out the realities, and I thank you for that, 
because there needs to be a truth teller out there and you're the truth teller. Okay? You, you've just called it like it is transparently. Listen, yep. here, here's some of the things you're going to go through. Uh, wax up, your, wax up your, your, your surfboard because you're going on a ride I, and it's going to be a ride where a big yeah. wave may take you out. But then, then you end it with hope. Yep. Right. And our stories are stories of hope and the mm -hmm. goodness and the graciousness of God. Even your son who is in uh, uh, care mm -hmm. is getting the best possible care he can get based on his need. And his need is not his fault. His mother was an alcoholic and she drank while she was pregnant. And mm -hmm. she did damage to this child. And there's things he can control, and there's things he cannot control. And you yep. can you cannot strap your child. You cannot bind their wrist to a bed at home, even if you know that that's what you need to do to keep that child from inflicting harm on themselves. As an adoptive foster parent, you may not do that you cannot duct tape your child to a bed okay? mm -hmm. now if they're using restraints in a facility that is a regulated facility and that's what they need then you've done the right thing and yeah. it's hopeful because they're not able to injure themselves and under your care they had the potential to injure themselves right? yep. but there's so many beautiful adoptive stories and they're not told enough and I hope and I pray over this book right now, Lord, you would use this book to open up doors that more adopted children, more adoptive parents would be willing to step out and say, I'm an adoptive father. I made mistakes. I was an adoptive father and a single dad for seven years. And, you know, putting my daughter's hair in a bun I, we joke about the fact that I would take a hot dog bun and a rubber band and I'd put her hair in between the two hot dog buns and put a rubber band and said, okay, Fantastic there. Fantastic story. Th yeah, there I put your hair in a bun. Okay? Yeah. All right? That, that was, that was my, my introduction to single parenting of a little girl. Now, there's a, a you know, I, I found it on Facebook, a picture on Facebook and sent it to her. I said, this was me, wasn't it? And she said, it absolutely was you. She told me the story that the first time I told her, took her to go buy a bathing suit, all right? I asked the question, do you have anything in a turtleneck? <laughs> I, I was so overly protective of my yeah. little girl showing off her little girl body that yeah. I literally asked the question, do you where where can I find the turtleneck bathing suits? I feel I want, like an 1930s version uh, swim uh, suit. Uh, exact, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, right, but but now she and I can tell these stories, and they yeah. are hilarious. Yeah, uh, yeah. About the 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 mall battles. Oh yeah. my goodness, me and her in the mall uh, was was a battle. Uh, yeah. Facebook had just come alive. In her youth, it was a battle, yeah. a battle royale. Yeah, uh, yeah. Th th these are real stories of encouragement. And she's now runs a chemical company. Twenty-eight years old. She's a general manager of a chemical company. Uh, yeah. Obviously, I, I must have done something in that process yeah. of of ineptitude yeah. to do that. There's some great, wonderful stories. And Mike Berry, I thank you. I encourage every yeah. one of you out there that if you've ever considered adoption or foster care or, you know, you've, you've reached a stage in life. And I, I have a friend who's mid-40s, uh, just adopted. She fostered for seven years and just completed the adoption process. And I'm so proud of her because there were so many ups and downs and this wild ride. And she's a single mom at 45 or 46 years old taking on single momhood of an 11 year old and dealing with that. And uh, there are real stories like that out there and there are real kids in need and not every child that's in the system is a problem. And you, there's, listen, when you go to your, to your OBGYN, 
They don't tell you you're going to give birth to a perfect baby that's going to be perfectly developed and never have. You go into it with the unknown. I don't understand why we're so specific about adoption. It's the same blind ride that you have to take in natural childbirth. Why would you not? Would you, yeah. would you reject a Down if they told you your child's gonna have Down syndrome, uh, if you're a Christian, would you terminate that? You would not. But adopting a Down syndrome child is available to you. Fostering a Down syndrome child is available to you. And mm -hmm. I've heard amazing stories about how God used these incredibly gifted children who and they uniquely select God uniquely selects the parents. So if you're feeling that tug on your heart, but you don't know what to do about it, you need a copy of this book. It's entitled Confessions of an Adopted Parent, uh, written by Mike Berry, Hope and Help from the Trenches of Foster Care and Adoption. Mike, thank you. God bless you, my friend. Don't be a stranger to us. We want to stay Absolutely in touch not. with you and exchange more stories. Thank yeah, you. thank you for having me on. Thank you. God bless you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.